we're live. Okay, thanks, Shan. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Bernstein. I'm part of the new practitioner committee at ACRO. Thanks for attending this afternoon. I know we're all eagerly anticipating this lecture. So I have the privilege to introduce a, a friend of mine and mentor, Dr. Mol Gia from MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Gia is an associate professor and director of spine serotactic radiosurgery in the central nervous system service of the Department of Radiation Oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. He treats patients with primary as well as metastatic disease of the brain and spine using advanced radiation tools such as gamma knife, proton radiation therapy, image guided serotactic radiation, personalized to an individual patient's clinical case. Spine serotactic radiosurgery is an emerging non invasive ablative treatment option, alternative to surgery for patients with disease in the spine. As the director of the Spine Serotactic Radiosurgery Program at MD Anderson, Dr. Gia oversees the clinical as well as academic operations of the SSRS program, which includes serving as the principal investigator of two randomized institutional trials. He is also the CNS section director for MD Anderson Cancer Center Network sites, providing quality management for CNS radiation treatment at our international and partner sites. Uh, so it's, again, my privilege to have Dr. Gee here, and we'll pass it off to you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, attending. It's, a, it's an honor to uh, have this opportunity to give you guys an overview on uh, the management of spinal metastases, um, uh, uh, especially from a stereotactic perspective. So I'm just going to jump right in. All right. So these are my disclosures, uh, just some research support. Um, from uh, Electa. Uh, so as a brief overview, um, you know, primary spinal cord tumors are relatively rare. Um, uh, they comprise about 10,000 new cases per year. And in contrast, metastatic disease uh, is much more common. We see this all the time. Um, and about 180,000 new cases per year of patients with metastatic uh, disease to the spine, um, of which about 20,000 cases per year have some level of spinal cord compression. But it's important to recognize that as systemic therapies advance um, and, uh, and patients survive longer uh, with their systemic disease, uh, these numbers are expected to increase. And as you know, uh, the most common presenting symptoms for patients with spinal metastatic disease is pain. Um, they can also present with motor deficits, sensory deficits, or uh, autonomic dysfunction. Uh, it's important to remember that um, if patients have caught a coitus syndrome, uh, this may present as, as painless uh, uh, urinary retention with overflow incontinence. Uh, if there's any concern about the diagnosis, tissue uh, confirmation um, uh, is, is absolutely necessary. Uh, for instance, if you have a patient that has a history of uh, a uh, early stage uh, curable cancer, like stage one breast cancer, stage one lung cancer that received therapy years ago. There's no other sites of metastatic disease, and you're asked to see this patient um, with a, a solitary site in the spine. Please have a high level of suspicion and, and get tissue confirmation, order a biopsy uh, before proceeding with treatment. Um, you don't want to get into a situation where you biopsy and it comes back as either a non-oncologic etiology or another curable etiology like a chordoma. Um, uh, uh, and, and so uh, a workup does consist also of a total MRI scan of the spine if there isn't one at baseline. Uh, upfront management generally consists of um, dexamethasone as needed if the patient has significant pain or cord compression and multidisciplinary evaluation. So treatment options in general for patients with spinal metastases, from a radiation perspective, we can consider conventional radiation or stereotactic radiation, and we'll uh, talk about the role of each uh, during this, uh, during this uh, lecture. And then uh, surgery can, be, uh, uh, can range anywhere from a vertebrectomy to uh, minimally invasive procedures such as um, percutaneous stabilizations or laser interstitial thermotherapies or cement augmentations. Then, of course, systemic therapy plays a role in the multi-modality uh, uh, management of patients with spinal metastases. So um, we'll first start with a case presentation. Uh, and this is a patient of mine that I treated several years ago, a 53-year-old 
uh, patient with BRAF positive melanoma, originally diagnosed in 2008 with a neck primary. He received local regional treatment with surgery and radiation, uh, and then had a relative indolent uh, uh, disease course. He had local recurrence in 2010, treated definitively the following year, developed oligometastatic disease in the lungs, and that was treated with SBRT. And then in 2014, he developed uh, brain metastases, and that's when I met him for uh, consideration of gamma nephrodia surgery. During the procedure, he complained of low back pain during the treatment, and, and so we imaged his spine, and he was found to have a, a dominant oligometastatic lesion at T11. So we see this um, lesion uh, uh, involving the uh, right lateral elements invading into the vertebral body with a significant paraspinal component and epidural extension of disease. Um, and so uh, what are our options? Well, we know um, from historical clinical trials that the standard of care for patients with cord compression uh, involves uh, surgery uh, in addition to radiation. And, and that's, this is based on the landmark Patchell study that was published in Lancet in 2005 showing that uh, patients um, had improved ambulatory rates uh, following surgical decompression, following the addition of surgical decompression to radiotherapy. But it's important to put that trial and all historical trials into perspective. Uh, when these trials were run, uh, patients had very limited life expectancies, and so um, this is evidenced by the uh, primary endpoints on these trials. So. In RTOG 9714, uh, phase three randomized trial that we uh, um, uh, quote often, uh, uh, patients with bone metastases uh, and were enrolled from 1998 to 2001. Uh, nearly 900 patients were enrolled on the study. They received eight gray times one versus 30 gray over 10 fractions. Uh, the point here is that their primary endpoint was pain relief at three months. They weren't looking at durable local control or durable palliation out to a year plus. So keep that in mind. Um, and then in the Patchell study that I just showed, uh, 101 patients were enrolled again from 1992 to 2002. These are patients who did have core compression, but they were surgical candidates. And so these are a pre-selected population of patients with an expected survival of at least three months. The primary endpoint was post-treatment ambulatory rate. Again, we weren't looking at local control. And um, the median survival in the most aggressively treated patients, right? Pre-selected population of patients expected to survive at least three months. They got surgery and radiation. The median survival was only four months. But as we know, uh, we've entered a new era of uh, systemic therapy with the advent of targeted treatments, immunotherapy, et cetera. And patients are living a lot longer. Uh, so uh, in this review, um, uh, we see patients with uh, melanoma, metastatic melanoma, um, and if we focus our attention on panels B and D, which is overall survival, we see that those that received traditional chemotherapy in panel B, for instance, um, that's the black line, uh, their median overall survival uh, uh, in, the, in the first line setting was about, uh, about nine months. Uh, however, when we add targeted therapies such as BRAF inhibitors and MEK inhibitors and such, their median overall survival has improved significantly. And so we're seeing patients survive a lot longer with metastatic disease. And so that changes the paradigm in the way we think about patients with spinal metastases. So when we approach patients with spinal metastases in our treatment um, decision-making, it, it's important that uh, that this is done with a multi-disciplinary uh, uh, approach. Um, and this is a great um, uh, schematic depiction of, of how we uh, approach these patients. And I'm going to refer back to this often during this talk. But, but basically, we look at four uh, factors when we determine whether patients uh, ought to receive surgery or radiation or stereotactic radio surgery to the spine. This is the GNOMES framework. Um, developed by our colleagues at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, and so they look at uh, neurologic, oncologic, mechanical, and systemic factors and, and, and use uh, all of these factors in the treatment uh, decision-making uh, framework. Uh, 
And so I will uh, kind of discuss this as we go through the, uh, through the talk. But again, perspective multidisciplinary assessment and management is absolutely key for these patients. So let's start with neurologic. So neurologic uh, consists of whether patients have epidural spinal cord compression or not, if they have myelopathy or not. Um, how do we uh, assess epidural spinal cord compression? How can we come up with a common language to determine whether a patient has low-grade versus high-grade epidural disease? Well, there's the um, MESCC scale, also known as the Bilski scale, uh, developed by Mark Bilski and colleagues at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And, and this is a six-point grading scale that is used um, to uh, 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 semi-quantify the degree of epidural disease. So it goes from zero to three. Zero is no uh, epidural disease at all. Uh, then it goes to grade one A, which is epidural impingement without deformation of the fecal sac. One B, which is when the fe uh, fecal sac is deformed, but there's no abutment of the spinal cord. One C is when the disease is touching the spinal cord. And then grade two is when the spinal cord is actually deformed. Um, uh, and grade three is when there's complete obliteration of the CSF at the given level. So as, as you can tell, you need an MRI scan to make this assessment or a CT myelogram. So how about the patient that I showed already? What grade would this be? Well, we see epidural disease that is not only um, impinging the fecal sac, but uh, displacing the spinal cord and, and likely causing some um, spinal cord uh, deformation, but we still see CSF at that level. And so um, I would grade this as a MESCC uh, grade two situation. Okay, what's the next factor in the GNOMES framework? Well, it's oncologic. And what we mean by this is whether we're dealing with radio resistant disease or radio sensitive disease. Um, uh, in addition, we consider whether patients have been previously irradiated or not. Uh, if a patient has radio resistant disease or has been previously irradiated, uh, we, we are more likely to consider stereotactic radio surgery. Whereas if someone has radio sensitive disease, that would have us leaning towards uh, considering conventional external beam radiotherapy. So let's talk about conventional radiation. Uh, so as we all know, um, conventional radiation uh, involves uh, fractionated radiation either 8 grade times 1, 20 and 5, 30 and 10, um, using uh, 3D techniques, uh, ATPA, laterals, wedge pairs, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, the dose uh, is limited by the surrounding normal tissue. So using this technique, um, the uh, target, which is generally disease within the bone, uh, receives the same amount of radiation as nearby critical structures, uh, such as the spinal cord. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's limited data on durable local control for patients receiving conventional radiation for spinal metastases. Um, that wasn't a relevant endpoint on those cooperative group trials. Uh, and there's limited efficacy for radio-resistant histologies. This is largely extrapolated from other disease sites, such as patients with brain metastases uh, who had uh, received uh, conventional whole brain radiation. Um, and those, especially with radio-resistant disease, such as renal cell carcinoma, um, that did particularly poorly relative to other histology. So we know that they don't respond as well to conventionally fractionated radiation. And then, of course, there's a limited role in areas previously irradiated. Not to say that it's impossible to do conventional re irradiation. There's experience, um, especially out of Europe, showing that this may be a safe and effective palliative approach for patients. But if one is looking for um, uh, a more durable local control, especially for patients that are expected to survive more than three months, we may consider doing stereotactic radio surgery for that patient population. So I mentioned before radio resistant disease. Well, what is radio resistant disease and, and, and how, can we, um, how can we assess that based on histology? So uh, Peter Gersten from Pittsburgh uh, published this review in Spine where um, they identified uh, uh, several histologies that they deemed to be uh, uh, unfavorably responsive to conventional radiation. Um, at MD Anderson, we clearly consider sarcoma, melanoma, and renal cell carcinoma as radio-resistant disease. We consider um, breast cancer and prostate cancer uh, uh, as clearly radiosensitive disease. And there's this big gray area in between um, where uh, at some institutions, um, 
uh, colon cancer, non-small cell cancer, uh, non-small cell lung cancer would be considered clearly radio resistant um, for the purposes of determining whether patients should receive conventional radiation or stereotactic radiation. Um, and at, at our institution, we largely uh, place those in the radio sensitive uh, bin. As I mentioned before, re-irradiation using conventional radiotherapy can be considered for certain patients um, that aren't candidates for stereotactic radiation. Um, I refer you to uh, uh, Karsten Neider's paper, a review out of Germany, that um, offers guidelines for this approach. Um, uh, again, this may be an appropriate strategy for patients with, patients with particularly poor performance status or very limited life expectancies. Um, uh, but you can use this uh, risk score uh, and risk stratification to um, you know, guide uh, conventional radiation options in the rear radiation setting. So the next factor that's used in the GNOMES framework is uh, uh, the mechanical stability of a patient's spine. So whether a patient's spine is stable or unstable, um, radiation isn't going to fix that. And so this largely leads to a decision as to whether a patient needs to be stabilized or not surgically. What helps us with this? Well, um, uh, there is a spine uh, instability neoplastic score that comes uh, in handy. Uh, and this is a validated uh, score that was uh, initially published by Fisher and JCO uh, in 2014. It looks like several components to assess whether a patient's spine is stable or not. The location. So, if patients have a disease in uh, adjunctional regions, um, C7 to T2, for instance, um, uh, they receive a, a higher score. And the higher score you have, the higher likelihood that this is an unstable spine. Um, we look at other factors such as mechanical pain, and this is something that can be done very easily in clinic. Uh, if patients have pain in their spine that is worse when they sit and stand and relieve when they lay down then uh, that is mechanical pain and points you towards uh, a, a mechanical uh, uh, instability issue. And then uh, whether patients have lytic disease or not, whether there's any uh, vertebral body fracture or not, um, and whether there's posterior lateral involvement of spinal elements, all these uh, lead to a, the development of a score. And if you have a SIN score of 13 or greater, that's considered an unstable spine. Um, and clearly patients need surgical intervention. Um, if they are at six or less, then it's a stable spine, no need for surgical intervention. And then if they're uh, between seven and 12, then they're put, considered potentially unstable. And so if they're potentially unstable or unstable, then they ought to um, uh, certainly get evaluated by uh, neurosurgery or orthopedic surgery for consideration of stabilization. And again, uh, uh, keep in mind what I mentioned about uh, the distinction between mechanical and non-mechanical pain is particularly useful um, in the clinic as you're assessing a patient. Okay, so the last uh, factor used in the GNOMES framework is systemic. And so this is just an assessment as to whether a patient medically can tolerate surgery or not. And uh, that has obvious impl uh, uh, implications for um, the multidisciplinary management of a patient's spine. So our patient here, that I have presented has MESCC grade two disease from melanoma, a radio resistant histology. It happens to also be oligometastatic disease. Um, so what are our treatment options? Well, clearly we'd prefer to do surgery followed by uh, stereotactic radiation. Um, however, uh, he had significant cardiac comorbidities that precluded surgery, so he's not a surgical candidate. Uh, how about conventional radiation? It certainly can be considered uh, uh, however, uh, given the radio resistant histology, um, we'd be concerned for a uh, local failure, especially in someone with oligometastatic disease that's likely to survive um, a long time. And then, if we just do stereotactic radio surgery alone, uh, we know that there's a high risk of failure to the degree of epidural disease, the core constraint um, that we were using at that time with the DMAX of 10 gray in a single fraction. And so, um, we know that uh, we prioritize the cord. Uh, constraint over uh, coverage, and so we would be underdosing gross disease adjacent to the cord, and so there's a high risk of failure in that situation. Uh, and so we did enroll him on a prospective clinical trial in which we were dose escalating the cord for select patients with um, 
uh, uh, cord compression who were not surgical candidates, uh, and we treated them on this protocol uh, to 24 grain, a single fraction. For the gross disease, we do a simultaneous integrated boost approach, and so the CTV gets 16 grain, a single fraction. I'll talk about that later. Um, and, and, and on protocol, we allowed his cord to get a DMAX of 16 gray, and he responded very well. Uh, here, here are some before and after uh, images, and so on the left uh, is pre-treatment image. On the right, this post-treatment image we see just residual scar tissue, complete decompression of the spinal canal, and he had complete pain relief uh, following treatment. Um, and, and here's how it looks on uh, sagittal imaging, uh, where again, uh, uh, all we see is residual scar tissue. Take note that T10 actually collapsed following the treatment. He did have a fracture following the treatment, but he was asymptomatic from this, and so it didn't require inter any interventions. Um, I'll also mention that that uh, protocol has now matured, uh, and it is currently in press uh, uh, with the Red Journal, so uh, feel free to go to the Red Journal's website, and you can look at details on that clinical trial. Okay, so what are the indications for spine stereotactic surgery? I've alluded to them already, but here, is, uh, uh, here it is uh, more clearly. So we consider using stereotactic surgery to the spine in patients um, with radioresistant histologies. Again, sarcoma, non-small, or sarcoma, renal cell carcinoma, melanoma. Um, uh, we also consider using it in patients with oligometastatic or oligoprogressive disease. Um, it may be considered uh, uh, in patients with a history of prior radiation to that spinal level. And then, of course, in the postoperative setting, we can, we can use this tool as well. And these indications are, are, are not MD Anderson specific. These, these indications are, are, are supported uh, by national consensus guidelines. Here are NCC and guidelines version uh, 1.2018, um, in which uh, uh, the committee uh, cites that uh, oligometastatic disease, uh, prior radiation, radioresistant disease can all be independent um, indications for the use of spine stereotactic radio surgery. So if you get pushback from uh, payers, uh, you can cite uh, NCCN guidelines to help support the use of spine stereotactic radio surgery uh, for these indications. And over the years, we um, are, are using this technique more and more. Um, and so uh, uh, 10, 12 years ago, we were only treating about 16 cases a year. And, and as we've gained more experience, um, uh, we, these numbers have exponentially increased. And so um, we're treating around 150 to 200 patients per year, many of whom have multiple ISIS centers. So we've run prospective clinical trials at MD Anderson to show that this is um, an effective uh, treatment. Uh, and so Eric Chang led these efforts. Um, here's a trial that was uh, performed from 2005 to 2010, looking at single fraction spine stereotactic radio surgery, enrolling 61 patients. And tumors received um, a GTV dose of 18 to 24 gray in a single fraction. The CTV would get 16 gray. The spinal cord at this time was limited to 10 gray. Um, and uh, again, one and two-year local control rates were excellent, 91%, 88%. Uh, these, these were a well-selected population of patients, again, receiving modern therapies. So contrast this with the historical trials that I showed uh, before, um, RTOG 9714 and the Patchell study. Here we have a median survival of 30 months. So we've clearly, we're, we clearly can select appropriate patients to receive this aggressive treatment. There are no significant difference in, differences in outcomes with respect to tumor histology. So the idea or the concept of radio resistance kind of went away. And only one, there was only one grade th three and one grade four radiation adverse event. The grade four uh, event was a foot drop. We did uh, uh, additional analyses. So um, we, uh, the patients received patient reported outcomes, um, wow. including the uh, MDASI spine symptom burden survey, as well as the brief pain inventory. And um, what we saw was that. Uh, spine stereotactic radio surgery led to long-term improvement in these patient-reported outcomes. So if you look at the um, chart on the right, that chart shows uh, complete uh, pain relief or, uh, or, or no evidence of pain on the brief pain inventory. At baseline, almost a quarter patients had no pain. So these patients probably had oligometastatic disease, and that was the indication to treat. Um, and you can see by nine months, 
the complete pain relief level was almost two thirds. How about in the oligometastatic setting? So we did a secondary analysis of our prospective clinical trials, pulling out patients that had oligometastatic disease. So about 38 of our 209 patients treated on several clinical trials were pulled out and analyzed. 87% had true solitary disease. Um, and so uh, not surprisingly, our two-year overall survival was 84% in this uh, cohort. Um, but more importantly, we see that the median time to systemic therapy modification was over three years. And so um, but by patients receiving aggressive, local, non-invasive ablative radiation to the spine, they were able to either stay off of systemic therapy or continue with a systemic therapy that they're tolerating well and, and uh, that is effective for disease um, in the rest of the body. So, uh, so, so this uh, further justifies the use of, of stereotactic radiation to the spine in patients with oligometastatic disease. How about in the re-radiation setting? And so uh, Dr. Chang also ran this prospective uh, phase one, two clinical trial, um, analyzing patients receiving multifraction radiation to the spine for, uh, 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 in the re-radiation setting. So the one-year local control was good, uh, 76% overall survival is the same. So we can still, again, select for um, uh, uh, patients that are expected to live um, uh, a long time following uh, aggressive treatment like this, even if they've received prior radiation. And then the one-year neurologic progression-free survival was 92%. Uh, so what are the potential toxicities from um, spine stereotactic radiosurgery? Well, I counsel patients that, um, that in the short term, it's very well tolerated, but the, it, it is possible that they can experience what's called a pain flare. Um, this is a phenomenon that generally happens in the hours after the treatment, maybe the next day or two, where um, patients experience a temporary spike in pain, generally over the area that we've targeted, although there could be um, a reticulitis associated with it, so we could radiate. Um, the, the, the rate at which patients develop pain flare is a bit controversial. Uh, at some institutions, they report rates as high as 70%. We reported our experience, it was closer to 20%. Um, uh, and so, uh, one may consider using prophylactic dexamethasone. We don't do it here, um, and and uh, our friends in Canada are are performing a study, uh, I believe, with uh, the, looking at prophylactic uh, dexamethasone in patients getting a spine stereotactic surgery. So, what are the potential uh, late effects? Um, and so, uh, these are just uh, several notable late effects. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more in, in more detail about vertebral body fracture rates because. It's somewhat controversial within our within our field, um, but I'll, I'll get into that. Uh, the myelopathy rates consistently are less than one percent, um, and so uh, uh, we always counsel patients as to the risk, but it's very low. Um, how about radiculopathy? So patients developing either uh, long-term uh, sensory deficit along uh, a nerve distribution, so patchy numbness. Um, that's about, uh, that risk is about 10%. Um, and, and gen generally, I counsel patients of that risk, especially if there's foraminal involvement. We don't try to spare uh, uh, the nerve as it's coming out. We want to prevent hot spots in the nerve, especially in areas like S1. Um, but, but if we learned early on that if you try to, uh, if you aggressively spare the nerve root in patients that have disease in or near the foramen, um, they're likely to fail in or near the foramen, and then the disease, of course, will take out the nerve. Um, and then um, esophageal toxicity, again, uh, low risk using our dose constraints, so the risk uh, uh, at our institution is less than 1%. So let's talk a little bit about fracture. So um, uh, there was an early report from Sloan Kettering uh, suggesting that patients getting spine stereotactic radio surgery could be at risk of developing um, a vertebral body fracture. Uh, the risk could be as high as 39%. Um, uh, and, and that's in that first line of the third column you see here, the Rose study. Radiographic fracture rate could be as high as 39% after single fraction radiosurgery. Um, and so uh, some have argued that this supports uh, hypofractionating or giving the radiation over two, uh, three, or five fractions rather than a single fraction. 
However, subsequent reports have shown that um, have brought into question whether that 39% rate is, is clinically relevant or not. So the radiographic fracture uh, rate cited here um, includes asymptomatic end plate fractures um, and patients also who have developed uh, a progressive disease at that given level, uh, uh, which caused the fracture. But if we filter that out and we, we focus only on radiation related fractures requiring a stabilization or intervention, then um, that, uh, that, that, that rate goes down. Um, so in the last uh, line, the present study, this study is a follow-up at Memorial Sloan Kettering, looking at um, 551 levels treated uh, at a single institution with single fraction radiosurgery, the stabilization rate was 8%. So 8% chance that the radiation itself can cause a clinically relevant fracture requiring stabilization. Um, and so, uh, so put fracture rates within, within that context. Um, now, uh, to, to try to get uh, perspective clinical data, higher level clinical data to, to, uh, to give us a better idea as to whether the fractures that, that result from stereotactic radiation are cl uh, clinically relevant or not, um, we are running a randomized uh, phase uh, two trial at MD Anderson evaluating the role of prophylactic cement augmentation in patients at high risk of developing a vertebral body fracture after single fraction radiosurgery. Um, this trial is currently accruing, um, and again, it's a randomized trial. Half the patients get what we consider the standard of care, which is stereotactic radiation alone, and half the patients get stereotactic radiation with prophylactic cement augmentation. So hopefully we get some uh, results in the near future. All right, so now I'm going to talk uh, a little bit more about specifics in spine stereotactic radiosurgery uh, planning and how we do things here at MD Anderson, what our perspective is on, on treating these patients. So there's two key elements of SSRS. The first is conformal treatment. We accomplish this with intensity modulated radiation therapy or IMRT. And uh, the IMRT can be done using different techniques. At, at our institution, we do a, a nine field step and shoot IMRT technique but um, it's common uh, at other institutions, high volume centers, to use BMAT for spine stereotactic radiosurgery. So different techniques can be used. Um, uh, the second main element of uh, SSRS is precise targeting. And so this involves rigid patient mobilization and target localization using advanced image guidance. So let's first start uh, with the planning. What do we contour? So, um, uh, we fuse uh, the MRI. The MRI is the gold standard in terms of delineating the extent of gross disease in the spine. And so um, we've generally fused three different sequences to the planning CT scan. The T1 without contrast is, is useful, particularly useful to define the extent of intraosseous disease. Uh, the T1 with contrast sequence helps us with both uh, intraosseous, but particularly extraosseous extension of disease for spinal disease. Um, and the uh, T2 sequence is critical for delineation of the spinal cord. And so these are the sequences we generally fuse for planning CT. The, um, uh, uh, keep in mind that a CT myelogram uh, may be uh, particularly useful, uh, especially in those cases where there's uh, metal instrumentation at the level of interest. Uh, and you can use the CT myelogram uh, to uh, eliminate any potential uh, distortion that uh, the instrumentation can cause to the T2-weighted MRI scan. So we use that routinely for patients that have metal uh, at, the, at, at the region that we're uh, treating. What else can we use to help guide our contouring? So we use um, uh, the International Spine and Rare Surgery Consortium Consensus Guidelines to help define what the CTV um, is. And uh, this paper was published in 2012. Um, and the basic concept is that the vertebrae is broken down into six anatomic segments, uh, the particular body, the uh, pedicles on each side, the lateral elements on each side, and then the spinous process. And um, it basically, uh, here, this is straight from the paper, and if there's gross disease uh, involved in a particular uh, anatomic segment, you want to include the remainder of that anatomic segment 
within your CTV and then go one anatomic echelon uh, beyond what is grossly involved. And so there are several examples in the paper that you can use for a reference to help define um, your CTV for spine stereotactic cardiac surgery. Now, at my institution, um, we have a, uh, a unique approach in, in treating these patients. Uh, we do simultaneous genetic boost, so the GTV receives um, uh, uh, a high dose, uh, something you know, like, for instance, 24 grain, a single fraction for radio resistant disease. The CTV um, consists of the guy, uh, a CTV defined based on the guidelines that I just showed you. We also add a five millimeter margin um, to any extra osseous extent of disease, soft tissue uh, margin in paraspinal space. Uh, now, we don't use a PTV on either of these structures. Um, but keep in mind that there isn't uh, a consensus approach. Uh, many high volume centers use a PTV. They use a PRV on the spinal cord um, and they do a single target prescription. So there's not a universal uh, approach to these cases. So how do we um, prescribe dose to the target? So um, we look at several factors. Uh, we look at intrinsic radio resistance, prior radiation, at the site uh, and extent of disease and location of target. So um, we've published this um, uh, and basically uh, this shows that uh, there is some uh, evidence to support the use of biologic dose escalation in patients with radio resistant disease. So in this secondary analysis of our prospective clinical trials, we took out patients with renal cell carcinoma and no prior history of radiation to the site of interest. And we analyzed patients that received 24 gray in a single fraction versus those um, that were treated on an earlier protocol that received either 27 gray over three fractions or 18 gray in a single fraction. And we can see that those that were treated uh, to a dose of 24 gray in a single fraction had um, uh, significantly improved local control uh, we did uh, uh, multivariate analysis looking at various dosimetric factors. Really, the only factor that correlated with local control was single fraction treatment. This makes sense from the perspective that if you calculate the BED um, of 24 grain a single fraction, um, uh, it's, it's superior to that of 18 grain a single fraction or 27 gray in three fractions. But again, this is a secondary analysis of prospective clinical trials. This isn't randomized data. Um, so take, take it with a grain of salt, but this is why we um, uh, support uh, the use of biologic dose escalation in patients with radio-resistant disease. How about radiosensitive disease? So if someone has breast cancer, lung cancer, thyroid cancer, um, historically, we have treated those patients to uh, 18 gray in a single fraction or 27 gray over three fractions. But we recently did an analysis and published this last year um, looking at uh, this collection of patients with so-called radiosensitive disease. And um, it, as it turns out, those with non-small cell lung cancer and colon cancer um, did significantly worse than those with uh, thyroid uh, cancer and breast cancer, for instance. Um, and, and so uh, our current practice is to actually treat colon and lung to a higher dose. How about um, uh, cord constraints? And so the, the spinal cord generally uh, drives the plan. It pretty much determines what your coverage is going to be. Um, and so how do we know what the uh, dose tolerance is of the spinal cord? Well, there haven't been, thankfully, a lot of cases of human myelopathy in the literature following spine stereotactic radiosurgery. Um, but, but there has been an analysis uh, performed based on the existing literature uh, and, and this is here mainly for reference, um, but uh, you can look at um, the clinical, clinical data that's out there. There's data from Stanford, uh, and, and, and in this analysis, it suggests that in a single fraction, for instance, a D-max limit of 13 gray is associated with about a 1% chance of myelopathy, 14 gray. Um, is, is associated with a 1.6%. We use a 0.01 cc constraint, and we allow that to get 12 gray, which is pretty much like a pixel constraint of 13 gray. Um, and so uh, off, off clinical trial, that's what we use. Um, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering published this excellent uh, detailed dosimetric analysis of, of core tolerance in their experience. Um, uh, they use a, a D-max of 14 gray, and so these were – 
um, uh, nearly 200 cases treated to 14 gray. Uh, this, they use a CT, they use, always use a CT myelogram to define their cord. Um, so within that uh, paradigm, uh, they noted uh, two myelitis cases among 194 cases with DVHs um, and a DMAX of 13.3. So about a 1% risk. Uh, and so uh, they developed a, sort of a DVH no fly zone uh, on the right. And so you can use that to help guide um, uh, uh, cord constraints in your plans. So, so, so we generally limit the cord to somewhere between 10 and 14 grain, a single fraction. Um, but uh, what are our dosimetric goals for treating the disease? Um, we did a uh, patterns of uh, uh, failure analysis um, and, and did a detailed dosimetric analysis of patients that had a local failure or marginal failure following radio surgery. This was published by my colleague Andrew Bishop in 2015. And um, after doing an exhaustive, exhaustive analysis at 332 uh, patient sites that were treated, um, in which 23 had marginal recurrence, 21 with infield recurrence, we noted that if we uh, uh, can achieve a GTV BED D min of 33.4 gray, that was significantly correlated with a high, uh, a higher one-year local control rate, 94%. So what does that translate to? Um, it translates in a single fraction of 14 gray. So if we can get a GTV D minimum dose of 14 gray and use that as a planning goal, that correlates to a much higher local control rate. Um, if you're doing three fraction radio surgery, this is a GTV D min of 21 gray. So we do we have incorporated this into our planning directive um, and use that as a goal. Uh, we try to achieve a GTV minimum dose of 14 gray in a single fraction or 21 gray over three fractions. But what if you can't? What if you have disease in the epidural space uh, that's abutting the cord? Clearly, you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to achieve that. So, um, so in that case, then we consider uh, some form of of surgical intervention to uh, 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 resect epidural disease. And so, um, this this was published by Sloan Kettering back in 2013. This idea of doing a separation surgery uh, to remove disease in the epidural space, and then uh, intentionally leaving gross disease behind in the bone, understanding that stereotetic radiation can can follow and tr effectively treat the, the remainder of the disease that's away from the canal. Um, so uh, in their experience, 186 patients published mainly radio-resistant disease. They underwent a separation surgery with stabilization um, and, and followed this with uh, SBRT. It was usually a median two-level uh, decompression. They received various fractionations of SBRT. Um, and again, with their approach, their GTV was defined by the pre-op tumor volume uh, and, then, uh, and then CTV and PTV as described earlier. And with this approach, they had excellent one-year local control rates of about 85%. Uh, and there did seem to be a biologic dose um, a relationship. Uh, the hospital stay, uh, was about a median of two weeks. So, so, so that's a, a, a well-established approach. At MD Anderson, my colleague in neurosurgery, Claudio Tatsui, is pioneering this approach as an alternative to separation surgery. It's laser interstitial thermal therapy. And so uh, this is a procedure that's done in the operating room under MR thermal guidance, where he's able to um, uh, go in with a laser probe and uh, and treat the uh, epidural disease with heat. And so again, his goal is not to treat all the disease in the bone, but really deliver focused thermal ablative dose uh, to epidural disease. Um, and here's a schematic of what he is attempting to do with this approach. And so we see that uh, the, the thermal probe is inserted and heat is delivered. And this is done under MR thermal guidance in the operating room. So they can set safety parameters on the fecal sac um, and deliver heat uh, to uh, treat that disease. That's under investigation at MD Anderson. We have a prospective clinical trial uh, to uh, assess the safety and efficacy of the approach. Um, so hopefully uh, we'll have data in the near future. So uh, again, uh, the plan is largely driven by the cord constraints. We generally deliver, uh, a, a have a core constraint of somewhere between 10 and 14 grades for doing single fraction radio surgery in the de novo setting, and that's associated with a less than 1% myelopathy risk. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, we have a GTBD minimum go, uh, goal of 14 gray, 
and that's correlated with optimal local control. Uh, but uh, clearly, a treating center's clinical experience, QA processes, and multidisciplinary support must factor into any institution-specific dose fractionation and strength selection. And so, for instance, if one is starting a spine radiosurgery program, um, uh, performing spine radiosurgery with, with, with three or five fraction approaches uh, makes a lot of sense using a PRV until clinical experience is gained. Um, uh, to, to, to sort of advance to more biologic dose escalation as, as indicated. So again, uh, here at MD Anderson, uh, if there's epidural disease or disease in the posterior vertebral body, then we push the true core dose uh, to 0 0.01 cc's receiving 12 gray, and, and we have a V10 constraint of 1 cc. Again, this is when there's no prior history of radiation at that particular level. Um, and again, we, we do control true cord, not fecal sac, we do true cord. Our goal is to deliver adequate minimum dose to the GTV. And um, within this context, please keep in mind that accurate image fusion and cord delineation is required. Don't hesitate to use a CT myelogram if you're not comfortable with the image quality of the MRI scan. Um, uh, and, and the data that I've shown you for biologic dose escalation is, is compelling in my opinion but um, there's no prospective randomized data uh, available yet. And so uh, please take that with a grain of salt. So what dose do we ultimately prescribe? Here we do an SIB approach. Um, if a patient has received prior radiation, then we, then we do uh, radiosurgery in three fractions. If they haven't received prior radiation, our standard approach is single fraction, and we do SIB with the GTV receiving, um, for instance, 24 gray, the CTV 16 gray in a single fraction if there's no prior history of radiation in a patient with radio resistant disease. Um, and so th this is our general parameter that we, that we use, but, but, but certainly uh, we may consider a multi-fraction treatment approach if, for instance, a patient has extensive disease in the spine um, at a site of uh, interest, if there's post-operative uh, instrumentation or, or if we're dealing with disease at junctions or at the cervical spine. So there's some um, uh, room for uh, further personalization of, of dose fractionation in, those, in these patients. So clearly, setup error can have profound consequences for tumor coverage. Um, we did this uh, uh, study and published it uh, about a decade ago where patients uh, who had undergone stereotactic radiation to the spine, they, um, uh, they were artificially, uh, uh, or the plans were artificially shifted, um, sort of a robustness analysis. And it shows that if you're off by two millimeters, um, your, uh, your cord dose can be uh, uh, up to 20% off as well. So it's, it's imperative to um, deliver the radiation accurately. Um, so based on this study, we had used a translational error threshold of one millimeter, a rotational error of two degrees. Um, but since then, we developed or we, we have a 60 couch now, more advanced image guidance. And so we typically try to keep our translation uh, uh, translational error to less than 0.7 millimeters and rotational error to less than 0.7 degrees. How do we do it? Um, so for patients with disease above T4, we generally combine a large um, thermoplastic mask with a long stereotactic cradle. If you if they have disease at T4 or below, um, we do the long stereotactic cradle with a body fix and mobilization uh, approach. And then we, uh, at our institution, we do use um, the exact track system, the stereoscopic imaging, um, uh, and and we use this for the uh, initial uh, alignment. Um, and then following uh, exact track, we get a cone beam CT. And we get a cone beam CT because uh, we want to ensure that there's no residual rotational errors following the exact track uh, assessment. Um, after the cone beam CT, uh, we then get KVMV ports uh, to uh, just as a, as a sanity check, make sure that we're at the proper level uh, as we intended. And then right before beam on, we do a final exact track, and then during our nine field seven shoot IMRT uh, technique between each field, we get an exact track snapshot, which is a single, uh, which is a single snap, to make sure that there's no interfraction uh, motion. And with this, with this general approach, we we have shown that we can deliver um, this type of radiation with seven millimeter accuracy. Um, 
Okay. Um, and so before I before I finish up and get to questions, I think we have a few a few minutes still. Um, this is this is one other option that we have in the uh, uh, in the toolbox for patients that have um, radio resistant disease, but you're talking about disease that's extending to four or five levels, and you're uncomfortable with stereotactic radio surgery because. Of, of of the risk in treating extended targets uh, and rotational error, um, we sometimes consider treating this patient these patients with with um, what we call uh, SSID spine simultaneous integrated boost techniques. Um, one of the residents, Dr. Faruqi, will uh, has has uh, submitted this it's under revision with uh, PRO. Um, so hopefully the manuscript is out soon. But with this approach, we treat um, the spine with IMRT. Uh, the spine, the spinal canal receives a 30 grade bath, and then we uh, do an SIB uh, and try to get the gross disease up to uh, 40 gray. Um, and with this approach, our one year local and two year local control rates are excellent. So, this is another option we have for patients um, that aren't candidates for stereotactic radiation due to extensive disease. So, to summarize, a spine radio surgery offers durable local control and pain relief in selected patients. Um, the multidisciplinary management is critical, and a rigorous QA program is certainly required to optimize patient care, and a center's training experience may dictate the appropriate dose fractionation. There isn't a national standard per se, uh, and so it's largely dictated by a center's training and experience as well, um, uh, and, and, and that'll help dictate uh, dose fractionation for the target and OAR constraints. So with that, I'd like to um, thank my colleagues at MD Anderson for their excellent multidisciplinary support and care for our patients with spine uh, uh, disease. Um, and, and I will plug this conference, um, this Multidisciplinary Spine Oncology Symposium, which is conducted at Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, every year in about April, um, in which uh, many of the experts throughout the country come and give talks. Uh, it's really a great conference for anyone who wants to learn more about uh, uh, spinal uh, radio surgery and the multidisciplinary approach uh, for these patients. So thank you, and I can take any questions. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Gia. That was really an incredible review of an important, uh, intricate topic that's definitely becoming more pervasive across all of oncology. So uh, we really appreciate that. For the attendees, you can use the function on your computer under chat to submit questions, which will come to myself or Shannon, and we will relay to Dr. Gia. Um, in the interim, Dr. Gia, I had a quick question to ask you about some of the toxicity. You had mentioned that you have very low esophageal, either early or late toxicity. Um, in our institution, we've noticed that in the upper thoracic or lower cervical spine, that for whatever reason, patients have been having significant esophageal issues, and we rarely do single fraction, and we usually fractionate to three. Um, are you still doing single fraction at those levels? Yeah, we are. Um, if, if the patient hasn't had prior radiation to the spine uh, at those levels, uh, we do commonly use single fraction radio surgery. Um, and we've seen, and I, and I know that th there are re reports from other institutions showing higher rates of esophageal toxicity. We don't. We we haven't been seeing that here. I don't know. I don't know exactly why. Um, it might be related to the fact that we are doing this SIV approach, where the CTV isn't getting the full prescription, it's getting 16 gray rather than 24 gray. Um, uh, uh, for a while, we had a protocol open in which we were looking at whether uh, we should be doing dose escalation to the esophagus and monitoring for toxicity, um, but we couldn't accrue to it because it was pretty unusual for us to have patients with gross disease right next to the esophagus that was limiting our coverage. Um, and so uh, we, we actually didn't accrue to that, to that particular trial. Um, but, but yeah, no, we use, uh, we generally use a D-max constraint of about uh, 17 gray to the esophagus when we're doing single fraction treatment. Uh, we have a volume constraint as well. And with that approach, we just haven't seen many um, early or late esophageal toxicities. Great, thanks. Uh, we had a few questions come in for you. Would you do spine SBRT without the body fix system, assuming that we have exact track CBCT on board? 
Sure. I mean, you don't need to use the body fix system to do spinal SBRT. There are other systems that are out there. Um, uh, but, but whatever system you use, you have to make sure that it's validated, um, as an immobilization system. And I mean, you have to have a rigid immobilization, uh, to treat these patients. Uh, even if you have advanced image guidance with exact right and cone beam CT, you need to have rigid immobilization. I think it's a critical component of treatment, but it doesn't have to be body fix. I mean, there are other products that are out there, um, that, that, that can be used at our institution. We use body fix. Uh, for the for the mid to lower thoracic and lumbar regions, uh, otherwise a stereotactic cradle with a, a aquaplast mask for the upper thoracic and cervical. All right. Uh, next one that came through is what is the reason for exact track before CBCT instead of going directly to CBCT? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. Again, exact track uh, is 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 a tool that we that we have available. It's not absolutely necessary for spinal stereotactic radiation. Many institutions do SSRS without exact track and they rely only on the cone beam CT. Yeah. At our institution, we've been using the exact track for many, many years. We, um, we like the, um, uh, how, how quick it is and the fact that it offers um, uh, image guidance uh, uh, and int intrafraction motion monitoring to a certain degree uh, in between our nine field IMRT approach. Um, uh, and so we've, we, we do use the exact track as the foundation of our image guidance approach. And so when patients get lined up initially on the table with the lasers, we get the quick exact track. It gives us translational and rotational information to make the shifts. And then we get the cone beam CT as an ancillary image guidance technique, um, mainly to serve as a tool to, uh, assess for any sort of residual rotational errors, which we rarely see. Um, and then, and then we get the ports and then the exact track again before continuing and getting snapshots with exact tracks throughout the treatment. So we just, we, we're accustomed to that workflow. Um, and we think that it's uh, relatively, relatively efficient. Right. So this is, this next one's a, a two parter just about treatment physician. Uh, are you, do you do a CT myelogram at SIM or is it a fusion and if you were planning to do SBRT, would you do one if the MRI diagnostic was not done in the treatment position? So basically, how do you reconcile um, differences between diagnostic imaging and your planning CT? Sure. So again, we get a CT myelogram only if there's instrumentation uh, in place. Um, and then the CT myelogram is not done at them. It's done in the uh, IR uh, suite um, and, it, and, and it's fused. Um, the fusions are excellent, given that you have the instrumentation and such, and we fuse that to the CT sim uh, images, and and so um, so that's been our workflow. In the very beginning, uh, years and years ago, we were getting the CT myelograms and then uh, or having the myelogram done, having the patient brought over, and then um, getting the scan done with the dye still in place. Um, but we found that that's not that's not necessary. Uh, and so we commonly, and then for our particular workflow, my institution wasn't really practical to do it that way. Um, and so we get the CT myelogram, you know, it could be the day before, day of, day after the SIM, and then we fuse it in. Um, and as far as the uh, treatment position for the MRI scan, so we do have an MR SIM um, that's been a recent addition in the last couple of years. Um, and uh, prior to that, we had consistently used diagnostic MRI scans that were not in the treatment position and doing a rigid uh, fusion with uh, our CT uh, SIM uh, and using that to do our treatment planning. Uh, it's an excellent question. You know, when we're doing rigid um, uh, fusions, you have to be very careful uh, about the accuracy. And so commonly, dosimetry will do the fusion, but then I will review the fusion in detail and make minor adjustments, translational and rotational adjustments to the fusion myself um, to make sure that it's completely accurate. Uh, we are investigating the use of MR SIM uh, in the treatment position. We're formally investigating this, whether uh, what kind of value it adds. So whether we need to um, you know, get these MRI scans in the treatment position with the cradle or not. Um, and so we are currently accruing to that study and hopefully we'll have a formal assessment of that uh, down the road. That sounds great. Um, so probably have time for one last one, if you don't mind. The 
Question is, why use a nine field step and shoot technique as opposed to VMAT? Either technique can be used. The nine field step and shoot is something that we had been doing for many, many years. Um, Eric Chang had started the program in 2002. Uh, and so this is, sorry, this is, this is uh, something that had been done for a long time. Um, and uh, we are currently evaluating BMAT formally in our department, and we're starting to use it clinically in select cases. Um, but, but clearly, uh, I, think, I think we might move in that direction um, and, and start using BMAT. Great. Um, I just have one, one very quick one. Do you use, you talked about constraints, do you have a transection constraint or um, any type of isodose line that shouldn't encompass the entire spinal cord or is it more max um, point doses? It, well, it's both. So, so we use max point dose. Then I also use a, um, a 1cc constraint. And so I try to make sure that, um, uh, the, the, like for instance, in single fraction radiation, try to make sure that B10 is less than one cc. So this leads to the decimetrous carving dose out of the center of the um, spinal cord. So you kind of get this donut shape um, isodose distribution around the canal. And so I think you have to look at, you have to look at both. both yeah. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Gia. Really, this was truly excellent and, and such important information to be distributed to our, our entire community. Um, I thank you all. I thank all the attendings for coming to this important discussion. and. Uh, for those that can relate to their colleagues that might have been able, that might have missed it, this talk will be up on the ACRO website within about 24 hours, so probably by the end of the day on Monday. And just keep an eye on our schedule for our next ACRO webinar, which will probably be mid next month. So thanks again for everyone coming, and, and special thanks. Thanks, Dr. Gia. I really appreciate your time. It's excellent. All right. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks.